Welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants uh, National Webinar Series, Tuesday edition. It's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, a close colleague and friend, Dr. Paula Jamian. He's board certified by the American Board of Optometry and is a co-founder and director of Omni Eye Services of Atlanta, which was the first in the nation of an optometric co-management center. He is the author of two textbooks and is the editor of Review of Optometry's popular monthly column, Clinical Quandaries. He is a past president of the Georgia Optometric Association and as was the legislative chairman who orchestrated the passage of Georgia's glaucoma, narcotic bills, oral med bills, and injection bills. He's an extremely well-known speaker and served as a general chairman of the Education Committee for SECO International since 2002. He was appointed to the Georgia State Board of Optometry by, by Governor Brian Kemp in June of 2021. In 2014, he was a recipient of the AOA's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Award for Lifetime Achievement. In 2015, he was inducted into the National Optometry Hall of Fame. In 2017, he received Review of Optometry's Career Achievement Award. So with that, I'd like to welcome my good friend and colleague, Tremendous optometrist and speaker and educator, advocate for the profession, Dr. Paula Jamie. Dr. Sauka, thank you so much. Dr. Caldwell, I appreciate uh, both of you and Vanessa and uh, inviting me tonight and all of you tuning in for the next hour and 40 minutes or so. This is actually a, a very new talk because I know you all have sat through a bunch of OCT talks and macular degeneration talks and dry eye talks. And so I thought I'd kind of combine some of those and also some of the cases I've seen over the last year or, or two into a course that I'm calling clinical quandaries, similar to the title of my monthly column and review where we try to highlight cases that are perhaps stumpers initially, but if you go through the thought process, if you stay calm, if you don't panic, if you don't immediately reach for the phone to send them out, uh, that you can fight that initial uh, tense feeling in your stomach, that fear factor, and you can get through all these cases very successfully, definitely as successfully as anybody else could who you might send the patient to. So we've got a little bit of a Walking Dead uh, theme. Uh, I'm a big Walking Dead fan. I missed a few seasons in the middle there, but it's back for its last season. It was filmed in Sonoya, Georgia is how it's spelled, but they, the locals pronounce it Sonoy. It's below uh, the Atlanta airport and they have Walking Dead tours and it's very cool. So uh, we have not done that yet, but... Um, if you like a show and you've never seen it where they uh, stab swords and javelins through people's heads like 3,000 times per hourly show, uh, it might appeal to you. So <laughs> let's go ahead and, um, and get started. And first, I want to thank, again, Joe and Greg. I don't know if you knew about Joe and Greg. First of all, Greg is my Disney consultant. Whenever I feel like I want to go to Disney, he's been there. I think he averages, what, 30 times a year. And um, he knows Disney back, backwards and forwards. He also travels to a number of other places, as does, speaking of Australia, I think that's you, Joe, petting a kangaroo in Australia. Joey petting a Joey. Uh, exactly. And uh, so both of these gentlemen are not only uh, the organizers behind this this great company, um, Optometric Education Consultants, but they are uh, speakers in their own right, educators and uh, very, very smart individuals. So I always love listening to them and learning from them. One of the things I like to thank them for when it comes back online as one of their venues is Quebec City. It was the last trip that big trip that my wife and I took and just a special, special place, almost like being in Europe, but uh, just a little bit over the border. 
and uh, on the St. Lawrence, very European feel, incredible food. They like to speak French, but they do speak English, so you don't have to be afraid of the language. I took uh, 10 years of French, and I, I don't know a word of it. Uh, like I say, I'm flatulent in French. <laughs> Spanish is the, the language I think that I needed uh, to go to the grocery store these days. But uh, anyway, beautiful city, beautiful trip. And when they pick that back up again, when the quarantining and the COVID stuff has subsided, I highly, highly recommend it. As far as disclosures, uh, none. I'm not serving on any industry committees. I'm not a consultant or paid by any company. Uh, I will disclose that I've been fully vaccinated. Speaking of quarantining, I know that's a sensitive subject and it's none of anybody's business, but I wanted to tell you that I've been fully vaccinated. And again, full disclosure, uh, I've been fully vaccinated for rabies. I just finished the rabies series of shots uh, with my wife who was in our garage sitting chatting with a neighbor on a bench in the back of the garage when I heard this screaming and ran out to see a very terrifying raccoon that whose hair was standing on end latched on to Susan's hand and you can see the results of uh, the hand there so we knew that wasn't good. We didn't catch the uh, the little, you know what, and uh, so we had to assume it was rabid. And so we went through the rabies vaccines, and uh, four of them, not as bad as the old days where they stick 21 needles in your stomach over a period of a few weeks. This was four over a period of three weeks, and. Uh, much better than a neighbor who was going through his dad's journal. His dad sadly passed away of COVID during the shutdown last year. And he was reading his dad's journal and was talking about a great aunt back in the early 1900s that he was describing that had rabies. And they actually had to chain her to a uh, barn door and just let her go crazy and die there. So. Nobody did that to us. We were lucky that we had these uh, rabies vaccines and access to health care. But um, kind of a bizarre story, like I'm sure we've all, seems like the COVID era has attracted bizarre stories of all kinds. And so wanted to share mine. Speaking of uh, bizarre and odd and uh, maybe a clinical quandary compared to uh, 2021. And also speaking of SECO, and I noticed, you know, a small percentage of you had been to SECO. If you've never been to SECO and you've never been to New Orleans, where every restaurant serves amazing food and it's just a really fun city, I invite you to attend next March. We will be in New Orleans again for the second time. We were there a few years ago. SECO uh, was the last meeting to happen in 2020. March 4 through 8, right before the shutdown. And we were the first major national meeting to restart this past year. We delayed it a little bit until mid-April. And it was very successful. It was scaled down, of course, but uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful meeting. And to see people in person, everybody was safe. There wasn't one reported case, either on the front end in 2020 or the back end, this meeting that we just put on in April. So I'd really uh, welcome all of you to, to experience SECO hospitality and education. We've got some great special sessions, some great evening events from CE walking tours to CE cooking demonstrations to uh, a great raft debate on dry eye wrapping up on Sunday. So uh, I look forward to seeing many of you there. This was a picture, speaking of our 100th anniversary coming up in two years, that I dragged out of the archives getting ready for that event. And if we magnify it a little bit, look how far we've come. This was in a little smoke-filled room in the Radisson Hotel back in the late 60s. 
And a close friend of mine, uh, Dr. Bob Pinckney is right here. He passed away recently at the age of 97, an incredible optometrist. But one of the themes of tonight's course is gonna to be to be a good observer. And so I'd urge you to look at this picture and pick out a few interesting things. Uh, one of them initially that I know strikes all of you is the fact that there are very few women in the room and that reflected the profession uh, during this time period. And thank goodness that has changed, but I see one young lady here and two in the back and that's about it. Um, any other observations? Nobody's really been able to identify this bizarre looking instrument that apparently was part of a workshop and I think it related to vision therapy, but I'm not sure. And then if you look to the right of the photograph, the bottom right, you'll see an ashtray. And in fact, there was an ashtray at everyone's place uh, on the table in the classroom and smoking was allowed and you'd open the door to go into a room and smoke would just billow out of that particular room. And how we did that, I don't know, but it um, seems odd today, but back then it was the norm. So thank goodness times have changed. So let's go right into the uh, sort of the overriding themes that I have for tonight and then just share some fun cases. And Joe, if anyone asks a question that you see is uh, applicable to that particular slide or where I'm at, uh, please interrupt me. Uh, I will, I will. And I just want to let everybody know I, I, have, I have put the in the chat room the uh, handout for tonight. Very good. So uh, four formidable ways of fighting the fear factor and also at the same time defending yourself against malpractice, which you know, I think our malpractice rate in optometry is relatively low, but Joe and I both get dragged into some legal work here and there to try to uh, defend ODs. And it's frustrating to see some of the things that they do to get themselves in trouble and some of the things they don't do that would uh, keep them out of trouble. So what are those things exactly? Um, Bottom line is uh, dilation is still in vogue. And while you may not believe it, and some practices try to talk people out of it and teach people that it's a really nasty thing to go through, uh, it is the standard of care. And if you dilate most everybody, at least you know every other year, not particularly every single time, you will definitely help yourself in staying out of trouble. The basic tenet that Dr. John Amos, who was Dean at UAB for years, I used to lecture about in the early days before optometrists were really doing much lecturing is the eye not correctable to 2020. And John was on to something then and it's still the case. We can't blow off vision that's not correctable or the pinholes to 2020. And one of the ways to explain that is by dilating the patient, but we'll talk about a number of other ways, of course, as we go through the differential. Constantly communicating with your referral sources uh, allows you to ensure that the outcomes will be better than if you just keep them in the dark, get rid of the patient, get them out of my office, uh, I don't really want to deal with this and let the person I'm sending it to handle the headaches. No, I mean, there are patients. Uh, we're responsible for communicating. And just like we'd be upset if an ophthalmologist sent back a post-op with vitreous in the anterior chamber following cataract surgery and a displaced IOL and a, an edematous cornea with a pressure of 50 without any communication or any warning, they should be equally upset when we dump things on them that we're not communicating, that we're not telling them this patient's a little bit of a nut job. Why don't you avoid a, a premium multifocal lens? I don't think they'll do well with it. Or 
Uh, this patient is really upset about the surgical result. I just wanted to give you a heads up. And writing them letters and sending them emails and texts is very, very important in that communication process. And we don't do a great job of it. I'm gonna be honest, um, with our referral base, I jump up and down when I get the few letters that I get on cataract day that explain everything, including vision, refraction, slit lamp fundus, and what that OD and the patient have decided should be the plan uh, going forward and the goals post-operatively. But it just doesn't happen very much and we need to do better. And then if you are gonna send someone out, not only send them with a letter, but when you make appointments uh, for them or when you want them to uh, go to a particular place, uh, including this includes medical referrals or lab work or CTs, MRIs, then make, make those appointments for the patient rather than handing them a piece of paper with a couple names on it and saying, you know, call these people, they're all good and good luck. Uh, that's not going to stand you in good stead when the patient doesn't go to see those people and ends up with a retinal detachment that's longstanding or uh, lab work that could have been treated easily medically. Uh, make sure that they have an appointment when they leave your office. And I know some of you are thinking, well, what if they refuse to let you do that? And this is where being a doctor and being a forceful optometrist comes in. I mean, I rarely have anybody when I exert my authority, not being a bully, but when I exert my authority that refuses to do it. And if they say, well, I'm not sure on my schedule and well, you've got to have some idea. How about if we put this appointment down, we'll call the neurologist, we'll get you in in three days. If something happens where you need to change that, then that's up to you. And you've got in your chart that you actually made that appointment for that patient okay. on September 20th at 9 a.m. We definitely can't do it without an exam. Yeah. Yeah. So he would. I'm trying to find him. If we found him. And make sure, I'm sorry, make sure, please, please make sure you're. Okay. I mean, I just have tried to. Got him. And just be sure that you have documented in your chart, please that you made the appointment, here's the date and time. After that, it's their problem. And it just puts you on so much uh, more solid legal ground if something were to happen uh, as a result of them not following up with that particular doctor or you know, lab test. So make sure they see who you want them to see and that you, are forceful and make that appointment for them. And maybe Paul, number five, which you alluded to is record every aspect of one through four in your chart. Documentation is critical. And again, we see that all over the map when we review some of these cases, we see EMR that's incomplete or we see EMR where it's easy to check the normal slit lamp box and everything gets filled in automatically, but I'd urge you to go and, and specifically if you think that they come in with sudden vision loss in an eye that could be related to a nerve problem that you write in absolutely no APD by direct or reverse testing using the BIO light, um, you know, specific things like that. Uh, but Joe's right, the, the documentation, whether it's EMR or there's still a lot of handwritten uh, charts out there, and that's fine, but make them as neat as you can and as complete as you can. Uh, you'll never get sued because your handwriting's sloppy, but if, if a jury can't read something, they lose confidence uh, and they you know, will rule for the plaintiff, not the defendant. So it's really a um, balance, isn't it, between uh, referring at the right time, but also knowing that we are primary care doctors of optometry who are extremely well-trained and all of us in states with incredible uh, scope of practice laws where we don't need to refer a lot of things anymore. And 
We'll talk about glaucoma. We'll talk about a few other things, but it's just so important not to over-refer, but also to know when to refer or know when to spread the joy on a central corneal ulcer that you know you could treat as well as a corneal specialist, but they're going to be left with a scar. Spread the joy around a little bit and make sure they've seen someone else. It's just really driving me a little bit batty and I was cleaning out the gutters a couple of weeks ago and this bat actually came out of the gutter. Uh, I've seen them fly at night when we go for our walks but had never seen one up close like this. Uh, that we have gone from a profession in the 70s and 80s where we couldn't dilate and we had to send everybody out to a profession where we can do pretty much everything including more and more states where we can inject and do lasers and advanced procedures, and that we're not doing those things, that we're practicing almost like back to the future as if we didn't have any of those things. Um, giving up glaucoma to me is like an internist saying, I'm not going to treat hypertension or diabetes anymore. Uh, what are you going to treat? I mean, glaucomas are bread and butter. Financially, it can be an annuity, but we're doing it because we have the bedside manner, the skill, and the knowledge that 95% of glaucoma patients do well and are going to have enough vision to last them the rest of their lives. And you can do it as well as anyone else. You can do it better because your bedside manner is probably much better, which is going to drive up compliance. And then co-managing with surgeons that can do procedures that will take away some of that compliance burden on patients like MIGS, SLT, et cetera. Very, very important. Joe and I have been part of, and Greg, uh, the Opt Optometric Glaucoma Society for a long time. And just amazing to see a group of uh, glaucoma specialists on a panel argue whether a nerve is normal or not, whether they treat or not. They're not in agreement a lot of the time. So there is no black box with the absolute answer. Give it a shot, watch them. We've got OCTs, we've got fields, we've got incredible technology to indicate to us that something might be slipping and then send them when you need to, but not until then. So this is just an example of that, which is better one or two, um, an eight-year-old, hit in the eye with a Nerf gun recently. And the OD called me and said, I really can't get it. There's a little bit of cell and flare and it was a very minor hyphema. I can't get a look at the retinal periphery. Uh, what should I do? Eight year old, you can't get a look, get rid of it. Um, if you could get a good look, and you're following the patient, fine, but no good look, and it's a kid, know that that's probably in the high fear factor category. A 32-year-old African-American male who comes into our practice all the time, no family history, packs of 620, deep cups, but very intact, healthy-looking physiologic rims with no notching, 360, pressure of 15, why are we sending that patient out for a glaucoma evaluation? Uh, follow that patient. Do your baseline field and OCT and then just see them yearly. So to me, that's one of those low fear factors that it's just a shame that we have to send those people out. I know everybody's in a different practice modality and sometimes you don't have the equipment. Sometimes you're working for uh, in a corporate setting that uh, doesn't allow you to see Medicare patients. It's, you know, cash pay only. I understand all of that. But as soon as you can get yourself into a situation where you can do as much as is possible, especially looking at the history of our profession and the number of people that, the number of ODs that sacrificed and gave money and spent time legislatively to get what we have, it just seems like a shame not to use it. So let's go through my 10 tips and we will 
cover these fairly quickly. Uh, we'll start with tip number one, and it gets back to my point about uh, observing. And the more you observe, again, the less you have the fear. And if we're good observers, we will see everything there is to see. We may not have a name to put on it, but we can certainly know uh, from there how to describe it intelligently to someone else, to a colleague. And, you know, obviously, sometimes we do have to uh, send to different ophthalmology specialties, but what about referring to our own colleagues when there's something that we know they handle that we don't? Uh, we need to do much more of that. Well, here's a gentleman that I saw for a number of years, and let's take a peek at him up close and personal. And Mr. Bill was uh, coming in complaining that his left eye was a little bit fuzzy and it had been getting worse over the previous six months. He complained of intermittent, uh, basically mild light sensitivity, foreign body sensation, and now a little bit of blurred vision. So when we look at him up close and personal, I hope you can see from your screen that the irises are different colors. And it turns out that the right one is his, the color that he was born with, kind of a hazily light greenish with that brown, very striking brown pigment rough. When you look at the left eye, it's kind of a flat, muddy gray, isn't it? And uh, so definite heterochromia. Uh, there is congenital heterochromia. So if we were real good detectives, we would get some pictures of him 10 or 20 years ago, and we'd look at them with an indirect or a magnifier, indirect lens or magnifier, and we would uh, study the fact that he did not have heterochromia back then. Congenital heterochromia is a very interesting thing. I've hardly seen it. My nephew in Boston has one of his close college friends who has it. You can't help but look and stare at him when you meet him. And guess what his nickname was all through grammar school, high school, and college? You guessed it, two-tone. <laughs> to this day, they call him two-tone. That's congenital, this was acquired. So what else do we wanna look at? Well, that probably leads us to the first question, Joe. Yep, which sir. We can pull the audience, phone a friend and win a million dollars. So Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis is characterized by quick response to steroids, Mutton fat KPs and fairly significant cell and flare or formation of cataract and glaucoma. So, is that something I should be seeing on my screen, Joe, or not no. necessarily? Okay. No, I'm actually reading it for your benefit. Oh, so there's no, so are they going to actually? Yes, they, they, they're, they, they're working it. away. Okay, we, good. We've crossed 50% participation. We're going to let it go for just a little bit longer. We're going oh. for a hundred percent, even if we have to wait this out till eight, eight thirty, nine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Two things we have never gotten, Paul. We've never got a hundred percent participation, nor one hundred percent with a correct answer. Uh, come on, gang. Let's try to break that record. All right, we're gonna go just a little bit longer, and I think we're good with this. All right, I'm going to end the polling question right now, uh, Paul. I look, there are no questions in the chat room at this time. Okay. So you should be seeing that now, Paul, are you? Um, not. Slide is not advancing. Well, Quick response to steroids was 11%. Mutton fat KPs was 16%. Significant cell and flare is 27%. And the wide majority was formation of cataract and glaucoma. 
What percent is that? Uh, that was about 50%. Okay, great. So um, that is the answer, the slow formation of cataracts and glaucoma. Mutton fat KP, not exactly, because they're actually, as you see from the screen here, these little tiny stellate KP, little pinpoint KP that are not only on the inferior half of the cornea, but they're also on the superior half. So you'll see them diffusely. And the interesting thing and the pathognomonic sign is that there are little stellate connections between some of these fine pinpoint KP. And that along with the heterochromia, the low grade cell and flare are what characterize Fuchs heterochromic. The interesting thing and the reason that the diagnosis on this disease is delayed is because you miss the subtle things. Back to our being a good observer. You miss the iris atrophy. You miss the unusual characteristics of the KP. You miss the subtle heterochromia. You can do lab tests all day long to try to determine the etiology of the cirrhodocyclitis and nothing will come up. And you can treat them with steroids all day long from Durazol to Pred, and it will not well, the inflammation completely. It may control it a little bit, but basically the inflammation is something low grade that they're going to have to live with. And then our job is to manage to make sure they don't have glaucoma when they do develop it, if they do, to manage it. And then the cataracts, we've done many cataract surgeries on Fuchs patients and they do extremely well. We'll talk about uveitis in a little bit more detail later. So again, the more you observe, the less you have the fear. And I'm seeing this really interesting phenomenon with our students, and I'm not sure, Joe, if you are, because I know you have plenty of students at Center for Sight, um, not really understanding the difference between cell and flare and not grading them uh, each separately, but just if there's one plus flare, just saying one plus cell and flare as if it's the same thing. And on this top slide, you can see a beautiful example with the help of fluorescein that shows that you can actually see the beam. And that, of course, is the flare. They used to call it cell and beam because you can actually see the beam. It's like the beam of light coming through a cloud uh, at sunrise or sunset. And uh, the fact that you see the beam is the flare, the fact that you can see little particles within it floating in the convection current uh, pattern of the anterior chamber is the flare and each needs to be measured separately. But for everything that we do from uh, lid apertures, you know, saying ptosis OD, recording that on an exam today, and then 10 years from now, the patient comes in and says, my right lid is droopy, and you look back at your record and it says ptosis OD, how does that help you to determine if that ptosis has gotten worse? So measure the inner palpebral fissures and put it down. Uh, how does saying proptosis OU help you if you don't take a hertel and measure the eyes, especially in a thyroid patient? How does saying corneal opacities OU help you when five years from now, when you don't have the memory that you think you do, and you see this group of opacities peripherally, and you're not sure if that's what you meant five years ago or if those are new. And of course, with any diabetic saying that there is an absence of rubiosis along the pupillary margin uh, or the angle itself is very, very critical to protecting you should that patient show up at a retinologist office a year from now with neovascular glaucoma. And they said, well, the last person to see this patient was that OD a year ago. They must have had it. And try to recreate something that may or may not have existed when you've bulletproofed your record and you wrote down no rubiosis. I know a lot of this is basic, but it's so important that I remind myself of it every day and don't get sloppy and don't get cavalier, that I just 
love sharing it and repeating it so that maybe I can save one of you from sloppiness and, you know, a malpractice suit. So fear factor two, after we know we've observed everything there is to observe, is when you observe whatever it is that's in front of you, even if that presentation is horrible or if others have missed the diagnosis, it doesn't mean that you can't take a shot at it and that you will have a meaningful impact on this patient's particular problem and help them solve it. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's my 72-year-old neighbor, and I'm looking out the window here at our little 28-home uh, subdivision, and I think I've got several other neighbors in this talk as well. And she's a sweet lady. We've known her since we moved here in the 80s. And she was walking her dog, and the dog pulled her over. She tripped, and she landed on the left side of her face. And she somehow you know, stumbled back to the house. She was very disoriented. And she, I guess, must have thought that I wasn't in because this is one of those neighborhoods where everybody knows what I do and they all call on me for the least little thing like I'm sure all of your friends and neighbors do with you. And basically, um, she goes to see an OD right up the street who she had seen earlier. It was in the middle of the day. So I guess rightly so she assumed I was at work. Didn't call me, went to the OD. The OD sees her in the waiting room and says, we don't do that and sends her to the emergency department. And luckily on the way to the emergency department, which would have been a five hour fiasco. Trust me, I know we were there four times for the rabies. It's not fun and it's not cheap. Back to the rabies, we just got our bills, my wife Susan and I, $30,000 a piece. Yes, insurance will pay a good part of that, but 30 grand. The first visit was 21 grand. I'm not saying they charge her that, but to look at the eye without a slit lamp, maybe they'd do an orbital x-ray, I'm sure they would have. Um, but it still would have been a nightmare. So she called me at that point, and I said, let me come home early, and I went to the door. I did a front porch exam, and her motility was fine. I got her into the office the next day. Her retina was fine. It did not look like a blowout fracture, but when you first see that, what do you think? I mean, this is sort of what you say. You're like, I just don't want to deal with this. This is a horror show. So give yourself a chance and calmly assess the motility, everything else related to this case. And she was fine. It took a month for that swelling to totally resolve. But I checked and dilated her two different times and she got all her function back and did great. This kid, not so great, 25 year old, decided to uh, pick a fight at a bar and took a really large fist to the right eye. And he went to the ER on a Saturday night and then Sunday happened to be dating a gal who is the daughter of my marketing director. And anyway, you, you know the rest of the story. I got involved. Went and saw him on the Sunday and he had very little... Um, motility going uh, in the superior direction. So he had a blowout fracture, which is what the x-ray showed after we eventually got our hands on it. And that blowout uh, caused entrapment of the inferior rectus muscle uh, into the floor. He needed a Teflon plate and surgery, but not immediately. I mean, you put these people on oral steroids, antihistamines, the orbital specialists are going to tell you, let it calm down and I'll see the patient in a couple of days. So again, no need to panic or call 911 as horrible as it looks. So, you know, this is one that we've seen similar cases where a student will come out of the room and say, he's no light perception. And I'm like, okay, uh, how about if we open the eye? 
And when we opened his eye, he was 2030. So just take a deep breath, calmly check confrontations, motility, pupils. And knowing that it was a blowout, we were able to talk to the orbital specialist without panicking and got the instructions on how to treat the patient, wrote that all down, and then made the appointment at the appropriate time. So again, the message here is horrible presentations. Take a deep breath. Doesn't mean it's horrible. Doesn't mean they're gonna die. And just because they've seen two or three people before you that perhaps didn't wanna handle it, doesn't mean that you shouldn't or you can't. Uh, I'm seeing this a lot with high pressures, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Got a patient, I got a call two Saturdays ago. I wasn't on call, but the ODs, a lot of them have my cell number, which is great. And um, patient's pressure's 40 in both eyes. I saw her a year ago and the pressures were fine. I said, okay, what do you want to do? Well, um, I was hoping you'd see the patient. And... I paused for a second and said, well, do you have any glaucoma meds in your office? Now, if the answer was yes, all you do is put the drops in, right? Over a period of an hour or so. If the answer is no, then yes, you, you have to do something. I, I wouldn't want 40 through the weekend. The patient was a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit of uh, complaining of a little bit of haze. Had one today uh, before I came home for this talk, uh, pressure of 56 with a rebound iritis. That was induced by Durazol that we had used to try to put out the, uh, to put out the fire, if you will, after cataract surgery. But I just looked around, rounded up some Ropressa. I rounded up some uh, Combigan. I rounded up some COSOP and I gave them a couple Dimox tablets. And you should have all of those in your office. When you go back to work tomorrow, make sure you have a first aid kit of glaucoma samples. And if you don't, call your reps. If you don't have Timolol, pay $4, write it for yourself and go get it. Um, Make sure that you have a big bottle of Diamox, a bottle of extra strength Tylenol. We gave him all that. And by the time he left at about four o'clock, his pressure was 24. And so 58 to 24, that's pretty good. I can't do that any better than you can or than the OD that on that Saturday could, but you have to have the tools in your kit and be ready for anything. We'll talk about a little bit more of that when we talk about uveitis. You and know, again, Paul, when you talk about the uh, the kit that you have, sometimes I think we should get a compounding pharmacy to put it all in one bottle. We can call it Glockall. There you go. I love it. That's a great idea. Uh, there's some money in them there hills, Joe. <laughs> And then when they come in with pain, that doesn't mean you have to run scared. It doesn't mean necessarily that it's serious, especially if it's a guy, because a guy in pain equates to basically a baby. I mean, guys just don't handle pain. We all know that. And so when they come in moaning with what I call the positive washcloth sign led by three relatives, I mean, they might have a little metallic farm body. It doesn't mean that it's serious. Give yourself a chance, get their vision, put a drop of preparacane in and see what's going on. Fear factor three involves, just ties right in with that. Be calm, calmly assess the eye one test at a time. Don't go panicking and skipping tests. I remember more in the early days of our referral practice than now, but Paul, oh, I got a patient, uh, the, um, a lot of pain and um, I can't see. And Okay, um, Sandy, what's the, what's the vision? 
I don't know. I haven't done that yet. Okay. Uh, slit lamp. Haven't checked that yet. Uh, how about the pressure? No, nope, I haven't done that yet. What have you done besides sit them in the chair? Just get them, get yourself calm because the patient is definitely going to sense when you're not calm and it's going to amp them up even more. Don't panic. Go through the exam. Start the thinking process and follow up with whatever you need to do. Um, this is one of those that was kind of scary. She comes in. I had never seen anything quite like it. Both eyes very swollen. And I kind of joked who hit you, but that's not really something to joke about these days. And then I did the exam. And for some reason, it just, I, I sort of knew, and this is really before the glove era. So this is an older case. I took a cotton swab instead of my hands and I everted her lower lid and I see this really large and very um, rigid pseudomembrane. And you say, well, why don't you just grab that and pull it out of the eye and this wouldn't budge. And so this was a case with preauricular nodes, significant lid swelling over a period of about seven or eight days that finally drove her and her husband especially nuts. And they came in, it was a case of EKC. And so we go through the typical um, three things that I try to tell myself before I panic, have the patient look up, down, left and right. When they look down, pull the lids up. When they look up, pull the lids down, check for preauricular nodes and evert lids. And when you do that on every red eye, on every swollen eye, on anyone with a foreign body, you will never miss anything. But if you just look at the eye, stick them in the slit lamp, crank it up to 40X, shift it into fourth gear, and start counting endothelial cells, which is about all 40X is good for, you'll miss the big picture. You really will. So get that big picture. How about this um, neighbor who's two houses down from the last neighbor I told you about? And have I gotten uh, permission to show all these pictures? No, uh, major HIPAA violation, but don't turn me in, Joe. <laughs> this is an 82-year-old dear friend. He's a master Italian chef. He's got two kitchens in his house. He's always bringing food over. So the more eye problems he has, the better, because the more diagnoses I rack up, the more, uh, you know, tiramisu and uh, sausage with peppers and homemade pasta I get. So he had a sinus infection on a Thursday, and he wakes up with this red swollen left eye. And he and his girlfriend were concerned enough to give me a call. So again, I did a front porch exam and I'm thinking, Gene, I wonder if this has anything to do with 2019 when he presented with irritation in the right eye. Well, flashback, and I actually wrote this up in my clinical quandaries column back in July of 2019. He had involutional entropion. And so his lashes were just beating the heck out of his cornea and his lower conge. And so I used this little trick before I could get him to the oculoplastic surgeon, which was a few days later, with this piece of tape that actually pulled his lid and his lashes out. And he was, he did fine for, uh, along with uh, artificial tears until he could get the surgery. But when he had the surgery, this is what he looked like post-op. And you can tell that, um, I mean, this is scary if you saw this post-op, but he had entropion surgery and lid surgery causes ecchymosis and bruising. He did really, really well. Um, but now back to the future and back to this recent case, what am I gonna do about this left eye without a slit lamp? I'm going to have him look up, down, left, and right. He had a ton of diffuse injection, more inferior, a lot of lid swelling. You know, he did not have a preauricular node, 
and that watery discharge, a lot of pain. And I honestly don't know what this was, but this is an example of we don't always know what everything is. We don't always come up with a diagnosis, but as long as it's getting better and we have them on the right track and we take educated guesses, we're okay. Well, guess what? I said, Gene, what do you do for your sinus infections? He says, well, I take amoxicillin. Knocks it right out. I said, do you have any? He had a few left. I called in the rest. And we actually put him on Augmentin, which is what he had. Uh, he was on at 500 BID for sinus infections. I said, use a TID. And do you know that even though this eye looked horrible, and I still to this day have no idea what it is, whether it was related to that sinus infection or not, it started to get better. Day two, the pain was quite a bit better. Day four, much better. This is the day four picture. And you can see the shadows. I was taking, this is again, right in the middle of all the COVID friendly uh, frenzy. So I was, uh, I was on his front porch at a distance taking these pictures. And so again, I have no idea what it was, but day eight, it was gone. And that's great. And he made me some Italian food and, you know, I was happy. And I know the person that can appreciate that story is my dear friend, Dr. Luis Di Chiara, who's on the uh, program tonight uh, in the audience. And um, Luis, if we were neighbors, I'd check your eye because I know you're a good Italian cook too. So what happens three months later? Paul, oh, it's not as bad as the first time, but this eye is bothering me now. You can see he's got some rosacea, but this eye wasn't nearly as swollen, but the same injection, no preauricular node. I'm like, what the heck? Guess what? Put him back on the augment and it cleared. So the lesson is you just can't, always explain everything, but you can be calm and go through your methodical exam and rule out the bad things. This is a picture. I didn't see this patient, but we did cataract surgery on this patient in 2016. And this young woman uh, had been seen by her OD faithfully every year for her annual exam. Everything fine. Everything fine. Sees her a month ago and takes this picture. It looks like a thread on the back of the cornea. And I looked at it and I showed it to our corneal specialist who's newly minted, trained, and very bright. And she had no idea what it was. And she said, well, we're not gonna do anything about it, so just watch it. And that ends up being the solution and you know, half the things we see is to just watch it. How about on the topic of kind of lid swelling and preceptal cellulitis? We saw one caused by EKC, one maybe related to a sinus infection. What about this one, unexplained? And this did happen, I will tell you, last March, right around, uh, right after SECO and right after we had to shut down the practice for elective surgery. So I remember it well because I had to lay off 60 employees, like many of you did. And I came in with my residents every day and this man was sent to us and he was desperate, so we saw him. But his story before we saw him was that he had lid swelling and facial swelling and he figured it was a sinus problem, so he went to an ENT. The ENT sent us this picture and actually drew this around the, swell, the swollen area, either the ENT or maybe the patient did. He, he liked to take selfies and chronicle this whole thing. So the ENT gives them Keflex 500 QID. I know a lot of you may use Keflex 500 BID, and that's fine for mild preceptal or sty. But if that doesn't work, crank it up. Double the dose, 500 QID. That's what the ENT started with initially, and it didn't do a thing. So guess what? Even during COVID, he says, this is bad. There's something going on. I'm going to hospitalize you and put you on IV antibiotics, vancomycin and something else. And so five days of that, and he's taking selfies to chronicle it. No better. Absolutely no better. 
discharge him from the hospital because they needed the bed. And ENT is at a loss, sends him to an orbital specialist who wouldn't, wasn't seeing patients, did a virtual exam, sent him back to the ENT. He's desperate. The patient calls the OD. I don't think on that black rotary phone, although I did have one of those back in the day when I was a student. You had to rent them. You remember that? Anybody? <laughs> Raise your hands. Joe, you're too young. And uh, so the OD refers, wasn't seeing patients either, and refers them to us. My residents and I saw him. So I'm kind of scratching my head, except this gave me a little tip off as to what direction to go and not to keep going in the direction that the ENT was going. And that is that actually during SECO, right before a lecture on malpractice, I noticed some serious pain in my jaw and I isolated it to a tooth. My dentist who was closed agreed to see me, opened up the office full PPE, took my temperature 40 times, the total early paranoid uh, COVID period. And it ended up, I had an infected tooth. He ordered, he sent me to an endodontist. I got this cone beam CT and my tooth had to be extracted right after SECO. It was terrible and horrible pain. This is me post-op after having the tooth up. So having that experience a month earlier, I said, why don't we get you to your dentist who happened to be seeing patients on a limited basis Got the cone beam CT, and guess what? This wasn't his image. I never was able to get that, but he had an infection above one of his molars. And just a very unusual case that I had never seen. Just got very lucky that I had been through something similar. My face was swollen. His face was swollen. I'm thinking, why can't it be a dental problem? Let's investigate. This is him three days after the tooth extraction. Instead of an eye for an eye, we got a tooth for an eye. We saved the eye by sacrificing the tooth. He was very, very happy. He's taking this selfie in his living room and sending it to me. So again, when you're in that quandary of what the heck and I can't do this and I just want them out, no. Stop, time out, step by step good observer, vision 2020. If it isn't, you gotta explain why. We're all together on that so far, right? Calmly assess, know your oral medications, have a plan when you need to prescribe oral antibiotics, antivirals and pain medication. We did give him some more tabs. Have your DEA number ready to go, keep it active. I know I'm hearing from a lot of people well, I just got my DEA renewal. It's gone up to $888. Yeah, but your car insurance probably went up and, you know, your furnace went out and you don't not pay for those things. So keep your DEA number active. It took us a lot to get these laws passed. And hopefully your state has schedule twos because Tylenol with codeine wouldn't have touched this guy. He needs hydrocodone, which, as you know, got bumped from schedule three to the more dangerous category, Schedule Two, but most states have fixed that in their law, and so we can prescribe Lortab and Vicodin, that is hydrocodone with, um, with acetaminophen. Speaking of that, at the beginning of the pandemic, I know we're all sick of the pandemic, sorry, I'm telling too many pandemic stories, but uh, when there was, thoughts that you should stock up on Tylenol because if you got the plague, Tylenol was the answer. So I went to our local Publix just to see if they had any and it was totally wiped out, all sizes, extra strength, you know, 325, 500. But right next to it was the generic Publix brand or CVS brand, I can't remember where I was, acetaminophen. And there were like 100 bottles of it. And nobody knew that those were the same thing. But we do. So good for us. Fear factor four. And we're doing great. Right on time. 
sometimes you have to pull history out of people. You have to uh, play detective. They're not going to hand it to you. They're not going to just say, oh, yeah, here's my history in chronological order. You have to ask questions in different ways. You have to grill them. It's a CSI kind of deal. Uh, some examples, a 39-year-old with sudden onset vision loss. I saw him within the last six months. Dense white cataract, the other eye totally normal. Uh, sir, any trauma? You know, young person, cortical white cataract, I'm assuming trauma. No, no trauma. I said, uh, okay, um, any injury to your eye? No, my eye's fine. Sir, have you ever been hit in the eye? No. Have you ever been in a fight? I mean, the fourth different way I thought, that, I don't even know how I pulled that one out. Have you ever been in a fight? Oh my gosh, I just got out of prison. What are you kidding me, man? I was in hundreds of fights. <laughs> I said, and were you ever hit in the eye? Yes. So you were injured to the eye, yes. And that's trauma, right? Yeah, I guess so. So you just have to ask things in different ways. How about this patient who's a friend of mine and daughter of a, an OD who was a dear friend uh, since passed away, 38-year-old. I treated her for recurrent erosion. I'm not going to get into boring uh, topics like recurrent erosion, even though I like recurrent erosion. And we controlled it well with Miro. Uh, we debrided her. We, we had it under control. Everything was great until a month ago. What happened, Michelle, a month ago? Nothing. Are you sure? No, absolutely nothing. I mean, just I've been doing great for years. And all of a sudden, I mean, I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm terrified to open my eye because the pain is so great. I can't go on like this. It was very dramatic. And... I said, did nothing different happen a month ago? I mean, are you, you're still using your Miro, right? Oh, a month ago, Walgreens stopped carrying it. And so I haven't been able to find it. And I stopped using it. Voila. You got to pull stuff out of people. I said, how about if we restart the Miro? Well, I can't find it. Amazon to the rescue. 5% um, uh, drops are 38 bucks for a two pack and my ointment is 33 bucks. And she said, but I'm going to Florida in two days. I said, you have an address in Florida? Miro, Amazon ships Miro to Florida. And she was perfect after she started using it again. How about this guy? I have the pink eye and he comes in for his Second eye surgery, that would be the right eye. We had done the left eye uh, a few weeks prior. And he's 2020 and J1 in that left eye. He had had the new Vividi uh, Toric lens. The Vividi, most of you know, is not quite as uh, full range as the Panoptics by Alcon, which allows you to see up close. Vividi gives you distance and intermediate vision, but it's beautiful to use in patients with surface disease, epiretinal membranes, drusen, utata, any eye that you would put a monofocal lens in, you'd put a vividity in. And he did extremely well with it. And now he's here for his second eye. And by the way, uh, I've got this pink eye that my wife told me about this morning. Well, when did it start? I, maybe this weekend, I'm not sure. So again, the big picture, look up, down, left and right, pull the lids up and down. He's got sector injection of the left eye only. If it was a rebound iritis, you know, would, would this be consistent? That leads us to question two. What do you think it is? So I know you can't see this, Paul, but I'll read it. So we don't have the dead air, sector injection almost always signals episcleritis, scleritis, conjunctival abrasion, or sector iritis. Very good. So let's... And we're, we're going through very quickly. People are responding very well, very, very, uh, very efficiently. 
Paul, there's no, there's no questions in the chat. Something came to me directly that I, I did respond to. And somebody asked about, you know, how to record NVI versus no rubiosis. Is, is there a difference? Does it, does it matter? My, my belief is it doesn't matter as long as it's there. Exactly. Okay, I'd like to get close to about 80% participation. We're getting very close there. I'm assuming the 10% that don't answer just stepped out for a cocktail, which I'd be doing if I was an audience member. All right, we're going to end the poll and share the result. And the vast majority of people have said episcleritis. Some people said scleritis, conjunctival abrasion, or sector iritis. Can you tell me the percentage? Because that plays Epi, into this. Episcleritis is 93%. Scleritis is 4%. Conjunctival abrasion is 3%. And sector iritis is 1%. Okay. So nobody fell for the sector iritis. And everybody fell for the episcleritis. All right. Excellent. That means I've got some teaching to do. While Louise is cooking, I am teaching. So Joe, it's weird after these polls, the slide doesn't advance. Is that because you've grabbed control of? No, I have not. You should you should be able to you should be able to advance. Uh, there we go. So your tentative diagnosis, the rebound iritis uh, would have caused diffuse injection. Everybody agrees with that. Episcleritis, most of you think that's what it is. Scleritis is fairly rare and very painful and he had no symptoms. So let's take a look. So, I'm going to ask you the next time you see a patient like this, that instead of jumping to episcleritis, you put that on the back burner, and on the front burner is a conjunctival abrasion. Now, how would you look at that? You'll look at the heaped up kind of milky looking conge over the, or in the middle of the sector injection. And then if you want to prove to yourself that it's a conjubrasion, you're going to be amazed when you flood the eye with fluorescein, which I don't use a lot for the cornea, but I love it for the conge. And you see the big conjunctival defect here, which was the cause of his problem. So I'm going to flip that around and say that episcleritis is not rare, rare, but it's certainly not common and it's nowhere near as common as a conjunctival abrasion. And we've all fallen for that. So- oh, Paul, Paul, that me, I, I, I wanna echo that, 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 it, that it's so critically important. In terms of episcleritis, there, there's so many mechanical causes that I agree. I mean, episcleritis is not, that, uh, is not that common. Always look for the trachiasis, always look for the abrasion. You know, it's, you know, trauma and, mechan and mechanical irritation or toxicity is such a common cause of sectoral injection that you can't, you know, you can't overlook that. Exactly. I mean, the old genomycin and tobramycin aminoglycoside toxicity can cause conjubration. So uh, use your fluorescein and use your eyes and be a good observer. And how about some more history? So this is, we're still under the category of pulling history out of people uh, like Negan did in The Walking Dead when he was torturing the good, the good guys in Alexandria. Sir, any injury to the eye? Here we go again. No. Um, sir, have you been in prison in, in any fight? No, I didn't ask that. Uh, were you out in the yard at all? Were you weed whacking? Were you doing any, cutting the grass? Well, I might have felt something Sunday in the yard. And then 10 minutes later, literally, oh, wait, I was walking the dog. The dog escaped, went through some bushes. I chased the dog and a branch whacked me in the eye. Oh, great. And he just remembered that. Okay. Conjubration, sector injection. Dig deep. Episcleritis is rare. 
And if they don't have juvenile rheumatoid or a reason to have it, I mean, yes, they could still have it, but rule it out by putting the fluorescein in because if you treat a conjubrasion as episcleritis, it's gonna be with a steroid and the steroid's gonna delay the healing of the conjubrasion. Uh, so in this case, we treated them with an antibiotic and it healed very nicely. How about this guy? And this goes to Joe's point, no history. And he was a good historian of any trauma uh, to explain this three week pink eye. He sees his OD uh, given Tobradex. That stung a little bit and then stung more. So he went back, complained about that, changed to Vigamox. And now we're into drops for like $300 and eventually sent to us with a conjunctival ulcer. So let's have him look up, down, left, and right. And when he looks right in the left eye, everything's quiet. When he looks left, we see the nasal injection, just like our previous dog branch guy. He's got sector nasal injection. Well, why was he sent with a diagnosis of a conjunctival ulcer? Because of this appearance. How many of you have seen a conjunctival ulcer? I never have. Um, yeah, there were herpes lesions on the conj, which I guess could qualify, but this was as close as I had seen, but it's sector injection. And I heard my own persistent slash annoying voice say, it's probably a conj defect. So I stained it with fluorescein and it totally stained with fluorescein. But now what's the cause? Ruled out trauma. And Joe had mentioned trichiasis. He was warm. Let's raise this up. Anybody see that little lash barb there that was embedded like 90% into the palpebral conge and the little sharp barb was sticking out? And guess what? Every time he was blinking and moving, it was eroding that conge. Isn't that something? Paul, is, is there any way you can express the level of satisfaction you had at that moment. I was excited, especially when I pulled that lash out. I felt like, you know, Rocky had walked to the top of the stairs and in, in uh, Philadelphia. It was, it's a little thing, but it was a big thing. <laughs> so again, pulling history out of people, remember sector injection, and involve family members because sometimes patients aren't, um, you know, with it totally, and the family can fill in uh, the rest. I had a patient two weeks ago at our south office. I'm here for cataract evaluation, cataract surgery. It said cataval OU. So the student had done a cataval. We did A scans on topography, and we're ready to go, except. I saw this glistening coming back at me. A patient that had cataract surgery years ago was here for YAG lasers. So sometimes I cheat before I even finish the history and I look at them behind the slit lamp and that gives me a clue as to what went on. I wished I had done it with this patient. It would have saved us a lot of grief. And so we did the YAG, but nothing to do with cataracts. Number five, this is a really quick one. Don't be afraid to pick, poke, and explore. It really ties in nicely with the lash foreign body that I pulled out. This is a 23-year-old. This is an older case complaining. He was hammering something. Something flew in his eye, and he noticed irritation since. So he goes to a doc in the box. They diagnose an infection and charge him $250. But they did recommend he see an eye doctor the next day who also was a little bit flipped up by the language barrier, didn't see really anything. And three days later, he's still in pain, so he gets sent to us. All you see here, again, being a good observer is a little bit of dried blood in the corner of the eye, which is somewhat suspicious. And again, perhaps a little nasal sector injection. So what's our rule of threes? We're going to have the patients look up, down, left, and right, preauricular nodes, and evert lids. Uh, could you look down, sir? Mira para abajo. I knew that much. Good for me. Remember our threes. 
And when he mira paros abajo, abajos, uh, this is what we see. And sorry, I'm flatulent in Spanish too. And this subtle foreign body is sitting there, which you know you remove with jewelers. You could remove it with your fingers. You could probably blow it out of the eye. And of course, I did gonio because it was kind of an indentation. I did the fundus exam. Everything fine. Didn't even treat this except with artificial tears. Corneal foreign bodies are interesting. All kinds of flavors: metal, plastic, organic, unknown. The unknown are what gets you in trouble. What is that that you just took out, Dr. Saka? Ms. Jones, I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't know. I've had people stop payment on their checks or refuse to pay on the way out because they lost confidence in me that I didn't know what it was. So now I just make stuff up. I'm like, you know, were you outside at all lately? And they say, yeah, I was outside before I came inside. I'm like, it could be a piece of uh, vegetative matter from outside. Oh, okay. And then they want to see it. Have you ever seen that? They want to actually see the foreign body. So how about this one? Tick, 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 as we're ticking toward 845. Anybody seen this? Saw my first one recently. Tick, 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 that's a tick. <laughs> kind of disgusting. <laughs> For someone that hates cockroaches and bugs and spiders and ugh. anyway pull it out and there goes that farm body you don't have to know exactly what it is but it was hard to miss this one why do ods not take out farm bodies well most of you do in this day and age but i still have some people well paul it's deep i don't want to do this one deep is like mid vitreous okay if it's mid vitreous okay don't take it out send it for a vitrectomy or it's on the visual axis, a good reason to take it out. The patient's in pain, a better reason to take it out. I don't know what it is. Who cares? Make something up. These limbal farm bodies are tough, especially in a guy who's a mechanic who looked at this in the mirror for three weeks and then called you Friday at five o'clock. Anybody have a similar experience? Of course, we all have. So, Joe, the next question. Indeed. Question number three is coming up, our, our poll. When extra anesthesia is needed for a procedure like foreign body removal, what do you use? You can only make one. Tetracaine, lidocaine gel, extra preparacaine, or nothing extra. I like to see people in pain. <laughs> I wrote that. You probably yeah. did. You must have changed that answer, Joe. I would say real men don't need anesthesia. That's right. Tuck it up. So what do y'all think? And this is a very practical question because we're often called on to uh, provide some extra topical pain relief, not just for foreign body removal, but especially at the limbus, but gonioscopy. And then what about jabbing uh, needles into eyes? All retinal practices are doing it, you know, 40 times a day. If you have 50 retinal patients on the schedule, you're probably gonna do 40 injections. And that needle pain is not pleasant. So that needs to be blunted with something. So what kind of answer did we come up with? Well, we have by and large extra preparacaine followed by lidocaine gel, tetracaine, and nothing extra. I like to see people in pain. Oh, someone actually said that? I would have, too. No, three people said it. All right, three people after my own heart. That's the wise-ass group. All right, so I'm going to recommend this. If you haven't used it, it's um, lidocaine, 3.5% gel, used to come, believe it or not, in a 5 ml preservative-free bottle. And I think the FDA or somebody got wind of that. So now it comes in these little unit dose files, one ml, there's about seven good gooey drops in each one, about $8 for a vial, we buy them by the box. And this is incredible stuff to have around, again, for procedures like gonioscopy, 
or farm body removal of the limbus or corneal debridement. Um, you've got to have Act 10 gel and you can order it directly from Acorn. There's the gooiness to it. Put a drop in, let it sit. Yes, you can use extra preparacaine, but you should have some of this. Trust me, you'll be happy that you did. So this 28 year old, of course, gets a farm body in the eye, stares at it for two weeks and responds by calling me on a Saturday night. And I said, well, this has got to be a bunch of rust. So I pull out the algae brush and make sure the battery is working. And by the way, I have a couple of algae brushes um, on hand because they can go, they can malfunction. And I'm ready to take out this big rust ring. And I said, Paul, why don't you just use a spud and see what happens when you pick that little piece of metal up? Do you know that thing came out in one piece and left zero rust. So I would have taken that one foreign body and turned it into a million little ones. Instead, uh, I somehow had the revelation, let's try it in one piece first. The Davis farm body spot, I just ordered a couple more. They get blunted or dulled or banged up. That and the algae brush. Bill appropriately, I don't care if it took you two seconds to take that particular foreign body out. The patient will say, was that easy? Oh my gosh, no, sir. And I'll just stay there after I've taken it out. I'll just stay there for a couple of minutes. Think about what I'm having for dinner. And, uh, you know, no, don't tell anybody anything's easy. And bill them for the office visit, the foreign body removal, drugs and supplies if you use it. I love being a picker, poker, you know, puller of those lashes on our conjunctival ulcer guy. I hope all of you have jeweler's forceps, but if not, I went online and got this from Stevens Instruments, $29.99. Every, you know, six months or a year, we order three or four more pairs because the ends are so sharp that they can get blunted. Um, it's great to pick out, you know, white eyebrow hairs, not that I have any of those, or ear hairs or any hairs. So have a pair at home too, with that magnifying mirror that I try not to use anymore. Hey, Paul, before you go on to our next fear factor six, a question came in late, which I think, I, I think it's a really good question. And it goes back to tick, 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 okay. your, your tick. After removing the tick, did you order a lime titer or start the patient on antibiotics? specifically doxycycline? You know, great question. Um, and true confessions, um, that wasn't my patient, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, so I didn't do anything. <laughs> but would I have done anything? If there's a tick on the conge, uh, I probably would have ordered a lime titer because there's probably ticks elsewhere. You know, again, take a history. Are they working in the yard? They've been hunting in the woods. What have they been doing? Probably a really good idea. Another question came in. Limbal metallic born bodies, Paul, do you, do you use a bandage contact lens? Are they helpful enough? Or do you right, go right to a Procara? So I hate bandage contact lenses for anything. I had a patient come in the other day, hadn't worn her contacts in uh, a month, put them in. Took them out that night, noted hazy vision, comes in with bilateral, central, six by six millimeter abrasions. I've had too many patients come in with bandage lenses that then become infected with ulcers. They don't use their antibiotics. I'd rather use an amniotic membrane, but on a foreign body, limbal or otherwise, I, don't, I use nothing. Topical antibiotic and lots of tears. I don't think you need anything. Remember in the old days, we used to patch all these people. <laughs> I patch no one. I use almost no, um, uh, no bandage contact lenses. I do like amniotic membranes and for large abrasions, maybe we'll use that. But my patient with the two six, the bilateral six by six millimeter abrasions did fine. The next day was almost totally healed. Lots of artificial tears. Great question. Thank you. All right. So we need to move along a little bit and go to fear factor six, which is a quick one. 
which is know your systemic and topical drugs and their side effects. So is this pink eye? We've seen a lot of pink eye tonight. 65 year old sees a glaucoma specialist uh, in Marietta, next town over, put on COSOP, that didn't do the trick. So then put on Ropressa last August of 2020. Very upset because all her friends are commenting and she notices it in the mirror and her husband is saying, what the heck is the matter with you? Very beet red eyes. I mean, makes prostaglandin eyes look like nothing. So she goes back to the doctor and says, does it have anything to do with the drops I'm on? Everybody thinks I'm on drugs. And a couple of other views of it, which is better, one or two. <laughs> And uh, she was, it's almost like subconj hemorrhagic kind of appearance. This doctor, glaucoma specialist, says, No, I don't want to take you off of it. How about if I write you a letter stating that you're not on drugs? And if you get pulled over by the police, you can show them that letter. Are you serious? So, luckily, she had some early cataracts. And what I did is I stopped the repressa, which is what she was on, that also caused the corneal verticillata that you can see all over the place here. And that regressed some and the red eyes went away. We did a MIGS device with cataract surgery and her pressure came down and look at how much better. Aren't you impressed? Her husband really wasn't. You can see him in the background. He's not really too excited, but, uh, Again, which is better, one or two? Okay. And then, so again, knowing the side effects of the drugs that we use, very important. A 63-year-old comes in for cataract surgery in the right eye. The eye is very red. Can I still have surgery? Ma'am, when did it start? And I'm going through the whole thing. Um, yeah, I'm just on a blood pressure med. You sure? Anything else? Well, I have eczema. What do you do for the eczema? Oh, I take that new drug. They give me two shots, you know, a month. Do Pixent. And hopefully you've all seen the ads. They're like ad nauseum on the networks. And you look up Do Pixent. I learned this from Dr. Caroline Pate when she came to a district meeting in Atlanta and first told us about it when Do Pixent had just come out. Dupixent causes red eyes. Now, it's a Regeneron drug. It's a monoclonal antibody. It works great on atopic dermatitis uh, and eczema. But guess what? You put a little steroid on it, you keep them on the Dupixent, it typically goes away. But if you didn't know that, you'd be treating them for viral or bacterial, or they'd come in with a bag of drops from the last three people they saw. Got to take the history and understand that all of these designer drugs that we're seeing on TV have side effects. So know your drugs. Um, this was a great review. I found Joe's a frequent writer and review. He's read this. Know your systemic meds, top 10 to track. We should know these by heart. April 2018 review by Megan and Michelle. I'm going to go over this quickly because I really hit on uveitis, but I'm going to just make a couple points. Don't fear uveitis. Uh, know your limitations. Get rid of it when you see it on kids. Send them to a pediatric rheumatologist and a uveitis specialist. Don't deal with it. I'm telling you, you'll get in trouble. But if it's a first time, one eye, it isn't recurrent, you just want to be sure that you dilate and make sure the fundus, the vitreous is clear and the, and the retina is clear before you call it anterior uveitis. Of course, when they come in, it's with no insurance, right? So this patient was seen by an OD on a Friday, put on cyclogil twice a day. What's that gonna do to these synechia? Absolutely zero. And for some reason, put on an antibiotic. Uh, can, I know he doesn't have any insurance, but can you see him Monday? Sure. When we see the patient, we're going to switch to Durazol, which is our preferred or PRED every hour. We had no insurance, and we don't get samples of Durazol much anymore. So, 
And then I had to give him the atropine and 10% phenylephrine because that's the only way you're ever going to dilate this pupil. If you're going to break the sneaky, it's going to be with those two drugs. And guess what? No pharmacy stock it, so you need to. A little bit of a problem because the last time I priced my lead tech price 10% phenylephrine, it was $150 for a 15 ml bottle. So watch out for that. Steroid ointment at night would be good so they don't have to get up every hour. Punctal occlusion so they don't taste the frequent uh, medication. We're, I think, publishing another article featuring Chris Roten in Louisiana. Um, pray for all the ODs, by the way, that got hit by the storm. And the Louisiana Optometric Association has a fund that many of us here in Georgia contributed to to help those that lost their practices. It's pretty bad just because we're not hearing about it with uh, the most recent storm. Uh, lag your tapering way behind their improvement. These are, these are my pearls for success in uveitis. Just because they come back two days later and they feel a lot better, don't respond one bit. Keep them on all the aggressive drops. When to run lab tests, when it's bilateral, when it's recurrent, uh, and then when to run the other way. Children, uh, bilateral disease over and over again. Don't be a hero. Uh, get some help. Or if you don't have a view of the retina. So go big or go home. Don't fear the uveitis. So Fear factor nine, I don't want you to be annoyed by the watery eye. We've talked about red eyes. This patient could have been on Ropress or Roclitan. And I want you to embrace the watery eyes. What do I mean by that? I used to dread this. A patient would come in and say, my eyes run water. And I'm like, oh, that's the last thing I need on a busy day with this busy schedule. This is just, no, please, God, no. Well. This is a gentleman that came in that way, wasn't a good historian. He came from a memory unit with an aide, sweetest man. Why is he experiencing watering? Well, look at his ectropion in both eyes. And then when you look really up close, he's got no punctal opening. It's totally stenosed. So we know why tears are running over his lids down his face. This woman says that she only experiences the tearing when she's out of her contacts. Oh, okay. So when you're out of your contacts, what do you do? Uh, I put on my glasses. Did you bring them with you? 99% of the time, of course, no. I left them at home. Did I need to? Well, guess what? She brought them and we looked at her with and without the glasses. Look at what it's causing. It's pulling on her inner canthus and her lower punctum. And here's the culprit, a malignant nose pad. This is ectropion due to eyeglass frames. Well reported in the literature. I've written about it a couple of times. I know way back in optometry school, one of the articles that we were um, that we had to do a search on and read, ectropion due to eyeglass frames. Don't forget about it. And don't flip out when someone says, my eyes are running water. Ask, do the tears run down your face? And if they do, guess what? It's epiphora. It's punctal apposition. It's a blockage. If no, those are the ones I hate because then I have to do a dry eye workup, which dry eye and I don't get along, even though I have it. So examine those punctal openings, irrigate, dilate, and that leads us right to question four, Joe. It's a comment, Paul. What lateral procedures do you perform? Just punctal dilation, irrigation. I use fluorescein, have them blow their nose. I do it all. Yeah, this is just kind of an informational question. By the way, Joe, you know, they're looking for a new Jeopardy host because that last guy that they picked got into some trouble. So I love the way you're asking the questions. I think you should apply. Oh, I don't think anybody can follow Alex Trebek. <laughs> That's true. Some of those guest hosts were good. 
All right, we're going through very quickly. Good responses here. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share our results. Uh, just punctal dilation is at 24%, irrigation is 15%. I use fluorescent to have them blow their nose of 41%, and I do it all, baby, 35%. That's excellent. So it's, it's a good mix. I'll tell you the one I wouldn't have picked because I refused to do it is flood the eye with fluorescein and have them blow their nose and then open up the tissue, and I've got to look at that. Yes, um, I'm not into the boogers either. I cannot do that. So let's just talk real briefly about the tools of the trade. Those that, that uh, dilate the punctum have a rudiman dilator. Uh, those that do it all are going to explore the punctum by going down in and toward the nose using this um, basically looks like a medieval torture device, but um, it's basically an explorer, if you will. And then the uh, dilating, the irrigating cannula with tools of the trade related to it, the uh, tuberculin syringe and irrigating solution. And this Shahinian dilator, uh, named after my uncle who came over from the old country, Uncle Armin Shahinian, I think we're related, um, but he hasn't given me a piece of the action yet, is a short uh, 23 gauge with a side port. And you can see here how it's designed. And you draw fluid out with the needle and then you replace the needle with the irrigator and you, with the patient leaning back, you squirt the fluid in, and we'll talk about the anatomy in a second. So again, I went online for you, and from the Ambler Surgical site, I found a Shahinian five-pack of disposable cannulas, probably good in this COVID era, for $51, and I found the actual metal one, which I like, for $60. And how do I sterilize it with alcohol and we're done. Then there's the Bernstein cannula, which is kind of a combination dilator and irrigator. But what you're gonna do is squirt fluid in and you're gonna hope it goes through and into the nasolacrimal duct and the patient's gonna start coughing and choking and you know it got through. But if there's a blockage in the common, it will come through and around and it will come out the upper. If there's a blockage in that lower canaliculus, like a, a little uh, calcium cyst, then you're going to try to hit the plunger and nothing's going to happen. So it's more diagnostic, but sometimes it can be therapeutic as well. And here we go in the eye, over toward the nose, push the plunger, see what happens. So our pearl here is always asked about tearing. Do the tears run down your face? And think about adding these procedures to your practice. You don't need to fear the runny, watery eye any longer. One thing that I fear more than the runny, watery eye as we enter our 10th fear factor, I see double. Does anybody like that symptom? Does anybody like hearing that? Either your receptionist coming back, got a patient on the way with double vision. I mean, I do head for the hills like Rick is here, just running away from the zombies. I hate double hey, vision. Bob. Yes. Bob. It's Greg here. You're, you might have fed oh, you might have fed uh, Joe there by uh, um, he loves double vision. Joe loves double vision. Okay. Well, I'm Somebody sending them all to him. Somebody's got to do it. What I do, Greg, with double vision is uh, I try to talk people out of it. <laughs> You're not really seeing double, are you? Maybe just a little, a little blurry, a little itchy, maybe a, you know, a little scratchy, but not double. And uh, unfortunately, if they see monocular, monocular diplopia, I love, but binocular, oh boy. So what are we going to do about that? Well. First of all, here's a trivia quiz again to see who's still with me. You know, Rick, who plays Rick in The Walking Dead, any Walking Dead fans? His name is Andrew Lincoln. Who's he married to? This is probably just for the older crowd. 
The younger ones can go to sleep. No, stay with me. He's married to Gail Anderson, G-A-E-L. That sounds kind of British, right? Well, he's British. It's amazing he had that, um, that American accent the whole time, got rid of his British accent. Who's Gail Anderson? Well, there she is, spiky hair, pretty. I looked it up. It sounded familiar. Gail Anderson is the daughter of Ian Anderson, the front man for Jethro Tull. Anybody know who Jethro Tull is? Okay. Silence. About half the audience. Okay. Um, this is the uh, license plate I saw on the day that I saw this patient I'm about to show you. I knew it was going to be a bad day. And he comes in with a swollen lid, and he's also seeing double. Well, I have him look right, left, up, and down, and he can't uh, abduct his left eye. So it's almost like he's got a six nerve palsy in that left eye. So it's six nerve palsy, but he's got a right upper lid ptosis. So let me check that out. And I have him look up, 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 and his lid fatigues down. So left six, lid ptosis that fatigues. Anybody? Later that year, look how good he looked. He's a myasthenia patient. He's on mestinon, steroids for a short time. Let's go to question five. All right, I think that's our last one. So we'll launch that question. Myasthenia gravis may present with all the following clinical signs except acquired vertical diplopia, proptosis, sustained up gaze fatigue and ptosis. Lock in real quick, we're approaching the end. Thank you all for bearing with me. I hope the cases were interesting and the time has gone by quickly. It sure has for me. Well, it's flying by for everybody, Paul. All right, I think we're going to, we got, we got a great response. We're gonna end the poll. Proptosis by far number one, quarried vertical diplopia, sustained up gaze fatigue and ptosis were all about the same, very low. Almost everybody's proptosis. Very good. Can't stump this group. At least they didn't say episcleritis. So quick facts, myasthenia can cause anything that an EOM palsy can. 75% of patients presenting with ocular symptoms, and we have to be ready for it. This is a neurological disease, so sending this to an ophthalmologist is useless unless it's a neuro-ophthalmologist. And then like our patient, treated effectively with an anticholinesterase agent like mestinon, and consider the thymus gland. And I'm going to hearken back to one of my mentors, Dr. J. Lawton Smith, a precious man who was from Baltimore, moved to Miami, and put neuro-ophthalmology on the map. Any new onset vertical diplopia in an adult is myasthenia gravis until proven otherwise. So if it's kind of weird and you think it might be a decompensated fourth, you want to do the park three-step, do you remember how to draw those circles and make them oblique and circle? I found a better way. Google park three-step calculator, and you'll come up with a bunch of these where you actually go in and which eye is hyperdeviated in primary gaze and you click right hyper. Right gaze, left gaze is the vertical deviation greater in right or left gaze. And you click that, then greater in right or left head till you click that and it will highlight the muscle. Imagine that. So this is after all those years of schooling and we can't remember it anymore, use this three-step calculator. Bottom line, don't fear double vision. The final factor is to put all these factors into practice. Uh, I'm gonna end here, uh, not go into the last case, but I want you to just remember to be a good observer, get the big picture, explain vision that's not correctable to 2020, uh, do a methodical exam, record everything, Protect yourself by making appointments. 
and you'll live a lovely, happy clinical life. I wish you all the best and thank you for your attention. Again, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Joe, for having me. It was a great night. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Paul. You're, get, you're getting a virtual round of applause in the, in the chat. Paul, I'm going to have you stop sharing your screen, if you could. Yes, sir. Hey, Paul, while Joe's launching the, uh, the, the, the housekeeping slides, I usually do those, but thank you, Joe, for doing them. I just want to say great job. I was able to listen on my way from the hotel to the Honolulu Airport. I only missed about five to seven minutes of it, and uh, it was awesome. Every time I listened to you, I learned something, so thank you for doing a great job. Thank you. I'm going to, I can't quit the screen, so I'm going to leave the meeting. Wish you all a good night. Well, before you go, Paul, I just want to say thank you again. You're getting a virtual round of applause from our audience. Great lecture, terrific lecture, terrific inf information. And that just kind of underscores the importance of 40 years of experience. Uh, it is better than an OCT individual field put together. So thank you again, Paul. We, we, uh, we really are impressed. So with that, that was clinical quandaries, fighting the fear factor. I think that everybody probably will be a little bit less fearful at this point.